Whether you feel like it or not, we are the wealthiest generation ever to walk the earth. If you're a baby boomer like me, you've lived through an unbelievable improvement in living standards and technology that's changed our lives beyond anything our parents and grandparents could have imagined. But let me ask you this. If we're so wealthy and so smart, why do so many people struggle with money and investing? How come two-thirds of Brits have less than a thousand pounds in savings? Why do most people reach retirement with only 30,000 in their name? Why is billions of pounds left to rot in high street bank accounts, earning 0.1% a year, when there are so many amazing investment opportunities out there? My name's Graham Rowan, and in this four-part series, I want to show you how to make your money work. For decades now, the investment of choice for us Brits has been residential property. So much so that we now have two million likes of that landlords in this country. That's enough to fill Wembley Stadium more than 20 times over. The argument in favour of buy to let is that we live on a crowded little island. We cannot build enough homes for everyone that wants them. Mind you, they were saying that before the 2008 crisis and it didn't stop prices from tanking then. So the question we have to ask now is, in the run-up to 2020, with lots of new government regulations around buy-to-let property, has it reached its sell-by date, or can you still find a way of using residential property to make your money work? To help me answer this key question, I've enlisted the help of some of the top experts in the buy-to-let sector including Paul Watson, who will talk us through the recent changes to tax rules, as well as showing us how he's still making money in this market. Barrister Tajinda Bala, who will explain the pros and cons of owning properties through a company rather than in your own name. And Jeremy McGiven, who will give us insight into the top end of the London property market, where you'll find some of the most expensive homes on the planet. The last two years have seen major changes in the rules governing buy-to-let investing. So I've come to meet one of the success stories of the sector, Paul Watson, to find out what's been occurring. Paul. Good morning, Graham. Good to meet you. Come on through. Thank you. So Paul, before we talk about what you've done here in this property, can you just explain to me these major changes that have happened in the buy-to-let world in the last couple of years? Yeah, sure. There's been three, really, to, of note. Uh, the first one is the change that has taken place with stamp duty. The government this year introduced an incremental 3% on uh, second or investment properties, anything that's not your own residence, basically. Then there's been capital gains tax changes. That has been brought down as a percentage of tax that you pay on most asset classes, except for residential property, uh, and so for landlords that will affect them of course. But probably the biggest change is how, from a taxation point of view, the government are going to be treating mortgage interest. So, I mean, I think that really is going to lead to, you know, a lot of extra cost and bigger tax bills, which I suspect means the traditional, you know, two-bed-off-plan apartment just doesn't work anymore. You've got to have a different strategy. 
Absolutely, you need to have an angle. If you are looking at a two bed just for the capital growth, uh, it will barely wash its face now, particularly if you have other income sources. Really, you need to look at specialist niche strategies, potentially like HMOs like this, and, and what we do are high-end HMOs. So just talk me through what that actually means. What, what have you done to the property and what, what is a high-end HMO? A high-end HMO is really a, a property for young professionals. So uh, we would buy a property, we would give it a significant refurbishment, spending quite a good sum of money. It's a long-term investment for us. Uh, and then we would rent it out by the room to people who are working. We, we don't take students, uh, but we are looking for young professionals who work locally, who are looking to pay a, a good quality rent, but for a very high quality accommodation. And what does that mean for you in terms of the kind of you know, yield that you're able to get from the property? Typically, typically uh, if you're looking at young professionals and higher quality HMOs at the higher pricing area, uh, we would be looking at yields of at least 10, 12, 14%, something like that. Okay. Uh, and what about uh, if you represent that as the kind of the money you've left in the property, the return on your capital? Then you're looking at something that's even slightly higher, to be honest with you, because obviously we take leverage, we are, we are borrowing from the banks, again, specialist mortgage products for uh, HMOs, houses of multiple occupation. That allows us to make uh, our money go further, you know, our working capital go further, so then typically we're looking at 15 to 20% plus in terms of return on our working capital. Okay, and, and in terms of um, how you now own the properties after these changes, um, are you doing this through a company or are you owning the properties in your own name? Across the board, people have them in both company structures and their own name. When we began, we started with our first couple in our own name. But as a result of the taxation changes on the mortgage interest, we have now bought our third and fourth in our company name. Paul suggested that we go and have a look at another of his properties that he has under development. With this townhouse, he's very cleverly adapted some of the ground floor rooms into additional letting bedrooms and therefore maximised the yield from this property. At the next property, he's actually taken a detached house and made some very enterprising changes to achieve another significant uplift in its rental yield. So Paul, a very different kind of property this one compared to the previous one. Tell me what you're doing here. Yeah, it is Graham. We, uh, we first of all are a detached property here. Uh, it was sold as a three bedroom with a dining room and an office and a double garage. So looking at the floor plan, there were some obvious things that we could change to get more rentable rooms. First of all, as you can see, no longer do we have a double garage. We now have two bedrooms and a bathroom in there which they share. We've also reconfigured the lounge and the kitchen and the dining room area to create a bedroom and a much larger kitchen and a lounge area for the housemates. Uh, and the study has now been turned into a bedroom. As a single family, somebody might rent a property of this size and style for around about £1,700 a month. By splitting it up and by renting the rooms individually, that can often double or, or even treble in my particular case, that 1700 is going to go up to nearly £4,500 a month. I'm impressed with Paul's approach here, finding a niche where he can generate well above average returns by using the HMO model. And by buying houses that need refurbishment, he can add more value. But as with all investments, it ain't what you make that matters, it's what you keep. After the break, I'll be meeting top property barrister Tajinda Bala who will explain the pros and cons of owning properties in a company versus in your own name. And I'll be meeting Jeremy McGiven, who will be showing us some of the most expensive homes on the planet in the high-end London market. Before the break, we met with Paul Watson who explained how he's making money from the HMO concept. Now we'll be talking to top property barrister Tajinda Bala about the pros and cons of owning property in a company versus in your own name, and we'll be seeing some of the most expensive homes on the planet in the company of high-end London market expert Jeremy McGiven. So what exactly is an HMO? 
it's a house of multiple occupation. In other words, each person has their own bedroom, but they share the living area, kitchen, and dining room. It's a great way of getting a better yield from a property because you can have six or seven people sharing the same building. Back in the 1970s and 80s, these used to be fairly grotty student bedsits, but as you've seen, the standards really come up now so that they attract young professionals who pay a good rent to live in the right area. But the one thing you must realize with HMOs is that each local authority has its own regulations about exactly how you have to run them, health and safety and all those kind of aspects. So make sure you know exactly what you need to do before you commit to an HMO in your area. In this part of the program, we're going to look more at the infamous Clause 24. This was brought in during the 2015 budget by Chancellor at the time, George Osborne. And it seems to defy all the rules of business because it states that private landlords can no longer offset their finance costs against their rental income to arrive at a taxable profit. So if your total income from work and from your portfolio is more than 43,000 pounds, you could be facing a much higher tax bill as these measures come into force. Caroline, for example, is a landlord in Plymouth, and her tax bill is going to rise from just over £15,000 to more than £55,000 over the next three years. The Daily Telegraph's finance editor described this as an Alice in Wonderland tax, and I have to say, I do find it really strange. So I'm going to get a second opinion from one of the country's top property barristers to Jinder Barber. So Tajinda, what's your impression of the impact of these recent changes on your buy to let clients? I think the, the impact is that clients now need to wake up to do something fundamentally with their portfolios rather than just sitting back and, and, and resting on their income. Well, many of them seem to be considering going into a, a, a company with mm -hmm. their portfolio rather than having them in their own names. Yes. What's involved in that process? Well, the first thing to think about actually when you tra start transferring assets to a company, think, well, there's a cover against tax issue possibly, there's an SDLT issue possibly, and what about the lender? And w what we're finding is that there is this route that is a statutory route that's provided by the government, by a parliamentary draft, that allows individuals to incorporate their businesses, provided the fact pattern of the clients are such that incorporation of these is a very good vehicle because it mitigates tax on SDLT and CGT. But we still have, we still need to consider the lender's position as well. So what's involved in moving mortgages that I have in my own name across into this corporate setup? Yeah. At the beginning of the year, if you'd asked me that question, I think it would be really difficult. Uh, I think now that limited company finance is becoming looser, which means that lenders are prepared to loan to corporate companies or, 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 or rather uh, effectively rental businesses where they're now incorporating. And, and, a, and a, an easy mechanism there is that what happens is that the legal charge remains with the individuals and they then hold the beneficial interest on behalf of the company. So the lender therefore still has a security over the loan. So if you think about the, the range of buy to let investors, most of them have one property, some of them have 5, 10, 20 properties. Is there an ideal profile that would suit this idea of putting it into a company? I, I don't think you can, I don't think, uh, well, a lot of accountants would tell you it's a straightforward identity kit. There's a tip box there, so that if you've got 10 or more, you can then incorporate them. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think the essence of it is, whether you've got one, two, or 10, the essence is, are you transferring a business rather than transferring an investment? And that's the key. As long as it, the, the profile is such, you're actually managing a business, then you should be okay. So if you're actively involved in things like the maintenance or finding the tenants and so on, you're arranging the finance, uh, it is effectively a business, and, and that would fit the profile of putting it into a corporation. Yes, it would do, provided that it, it is active over a period of time. I think in one particular case, it's before the court, uh, which has really led to a lot of those incorporations around the case, where the individual spent 20 hours a day, a week, sorry, actively involved, and then the court said that was sufficient. Okay. In that particular case, and, and the woman can say, obviously, I have 10 properties. 
But the courts went on to say it's not just a question of a number, it's the quality of the acting uh, engagement. Okay, so I think what we're saying in summary is that now more than ever, you really need to get some good advice about how you structure your buy to let portfolio. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. If you don't do anything, your effective tax rate is going to go up to 45% or, or, or north of that. If you incorporate, you're going to be staggered at 20. And indeed, by 2020, corporation tax are coming down to 17%. Let's see what Brexit brings the call. To Jinder Bala, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. With all these new rules and regulations, it's important to get good advice about how to structure your portfolio. Equally important is where you choose to invest. If you listen to the media, they'd have you believe that the UK property market is a single entity. The reality is that there are hundreds of different markets based on location and size. One very different market is known as Prime Central London, where apartments change hands for telephone number prices often from one overseas investor to another. To find out more, I'm meeting up with London property expert Jeremy McGiven outside the most expensive block of flats in the country, One Hyde Park. Jeremy, hi. Hi, Great hi. to meet you. How are you doing? Um, I mean, okay, this is a lovely location in Hyde Park. You know, it's very nice here, but why would somebody pay 75 million quid for an apartment in this building behind us? Well, um, you have to put it into perspective. If you're worth five billion pounds and you're buying a flat for 75 million, it's equivalent to someone with a million pounds buying a 15,000 pound car. So it's not quite as mad as it seems at first sight. Okay, but are they perhaps driven by different motivations and criteria to your average person buying a home? Uh, there are different drivers. I mean, they have international lifestyles, obviously security is very key for such people and the security in one high park is second to none. Um, but it, these are people who you know, may have properties in the south of France, Paris, mm. Dubai, New York, all over the world, and have an international lifestyle. Okay. But I mean, I think there have been signs that the top end of the market, even with all those benefits, mm. is starting to come down a little bit. I mean, what are you seeing in terms of either price reductions or, or, or hidden discounts? Yeah, well, prices have definitely been coming down. Um, not quite as much as the press would have you believe, um, but there's been a huge fall in transaction levels mm. and th throughout the UK, but in London especially, and transaction levels are roughly down 35 to 40% on last year, and in the 10 million plus range, they're down over 80%. Mm. So uh, there's been a definite fall there, and there have been price reductions, uh, and again, that varies from area to area, and price range to price range. Okay, what about Brexit? Has that had any specific impact on the high-end market? Um, it's added to the uncertainty, unquestionably, and so that's meant more people are sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. Um, but actually, the price falls you were talking about uh, have been happening since 2014, and that's because of huge numbers of tax changes, the increase in stamp duty land tax, we had the election last year, and obviously the referendum, so it's just all the uncertainty is um, giving people pause for thought. So do you think there's scope for, for British investors to make money in this high-end market, or is it best left to the wealthy foreigners? Well, if wealthy foreigners can make money, then so can UK money. Uh, the, the thing is, you have to make sure you're buying good quality properties. A lot of people think they can just buy in Kensington, Chelsea, Belgravia, and make a killing. It's just not that simple. So you have to be very careful what you buy. But uh, if foreign investors can make money, UK investors can make money, and UK developers are making money, so therefore the UK investor can make money. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, Jeremy. Pleasure. Thank you. Unless you've won the lottery or you're a Russian oligarch wanting to park some money offshore, prime central London may not be the best way to make your money work. Residential property is the most popular investment in the country. Most people believe that bricks and mortar is the best long-term wealth creator of all. There's no doubt that lots of people have made their fortune in buy to let, but I want to raise a great big yellow warning flag here. There's a lot of what I call dumb money finding its way into the buy to let market right now. People who think that regardless of how low the yield or the amount of cash they can take out, property will always win through in the end. My view is that residential property is just another asset class that goes through cycles when it's up, down or sideways. Like most assets, it's been artificially manipulated and inflated in the last decade by close to zero interest rates and central bank money printing. I for one believe that in the next two to four years, we're due another financial crisis. It'll affect property markets, stock markets and bond markets. 
So the only way of playing residential property in this kind of market, I believe, is like the Monopoly board game. You're looking for rental income. You're looking for positive cash flow. And if there is any capital gain, well, that'll be a bonus. But if you think you can invest in residential property in this market, purely going for capital gain, be very careful out there.